Genesis chapter 22. Genesis chapter 22. The first book in the Bible. Uh, the word Genesis means beginnings. How something starts, how something originates. And we learn a lot of things by studying the book of Genesis. We learn a lot of God's patterns for the future. His calling out of Abraham, his selective uh, choice of Abraham to be the father of a new nation we call the Jews. And uh, he reveals himself to the world through them. And a number of things we see great foreshadows and types of in this very first book of the Bible. Genesis chapter 22. Uh, let me start by saying it's a great thing to know that God loves you. Um, you can be you can wonder about other people's motives. You can wonder about their their promise that oh, I love you. I, I really do. You don't know if they do or not. They, they might. They might not love you. They might be just telling it to you to make you feel good. And just the same way you tell them that you love them, right? To make them feel good. And sometimes we say things that we, in our hearts, we want to mean, but the flesh is weak. We don't follow through. We say, well, I'm going to take that request you gave me. I'm going to pray to God about it. And we, it makes them that person feel good at the moment, but sometimes we don't follow through and actually pray about that need. You know, the, the, the life of a Christian is supposed to be a ministry to other people. Not just other Christians, but other people as well. And uh, follow through when you say something like that to someone. And uh, also, when you tell someone you love them, don't, don't tell it to them if you don't mean it, right? You know how they say, uh, don't point a gun at someone unless you are ready to fire? <laughs> well, don't tell someone you love them unless you actually mean it. Because it's not, it's dishonest if you don't, and uh, it's not fair to them. It's not very kind to them at all. But it's great to know that God loves you, that the creator of the universe has a special uh, affection and a special fondness for you because you have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ to save you. And um, you might hear out in the world the idea that because God is a God of love or God is love, that uh, he wouldn't send anyone to hell. He wouldn't punish anybody uh, who dies having never been saved, like we think of it. And that's false. That's false thinking. Uh, every parent loves their child, but sometimes, uh, sometime along the way, uh, you got to spank them. They're asking for it. So don't deny it to them. I mean, <laughs> follow through. If they, if they say, um, if they're disobedient, uh, you have to follow through and show, teach them respect for you as their father or mother um, because it's going to transfer later in life for respect to authority, respect for the police, respect for the government, respect for their school teachers, respect for all kinds of things. Those things are, are taught when children are growing up, they're under the, the tutelage, the, the, the authority of their parents. And they learn those things from their parents. And, uh, but it's great to know that God loves you because uh, you've trusted Christ and that no matter what you do, after having trusted him, you can never go to hell. Amen. And it sounds cocky, it sounds arrogant and pompous and braggadocio to say, there's not a thing I can do to go to hell now that I've trusted Jesus Christ because I'm depending on him to save me, to wash me clean from my sin and uh, by his, by trusting in his death, my name has been written in heaven Amen. and uh, no, it's, it's in permanent ink, right? It can't be erased. But um, I want to consider the love of God. Maybe we'll understand a little bit better as we go today, but Genesis 22, and let's read the first two verses as we get underway. It says, And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham. Hebrews 11 says that God tried him. That is, he was testing him. And he said unto him, Abraham. And he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. I'm going to call this sermon today, God Loves You, True or False? 
God loves you. True or false? That's the title. Here in verse 2, the word love occurs for the very first time in the scriptures. Thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest. This should be very instructive to us as Christians because it shows you what God's God's pattern, his paradigm of love actually is in the Bible. It's the love that a father has for his son. The whole nation was shocked years ago. It's been about 10, 12 years ago now. There's a woman named Susan Smith down in uh, South Carolina. She had her two little babies, two little toddlers in the back seat in their car seats, and she drove that car off the road into a lake and let those babies drown in that car. Um, and then went on and reported that said that there was someone that had carjacked her and stolen her car. And uh, there was a, a massive search for it going on for those babies in that car. And uh, turns out she was the guilty party after all. And she had some ulterior motives. She had another uh, boyfriend she was interested in, and she thought her life would be better if she just leave her husband and not have children uh, to be responsible for, and she can move on with somebody else. And I'll never forget that story, because the same day that it broke in the national news, there was a case right out here in Riverside County of a woman who was charged with sh the shooting deaths of her own children. And um, when they, they I were watching the, the evening news, and one of the local investigators here in Riverside County said it, once they interviewed the woman, uh, the suspect in this death case it seemed as though they he said it seemed like we cared about her children much more than she cared about them and undoubtedly that was so there was another case about 10 years ago of a woman who jumped off a bridge uh, near Los Angeles holding her two little toddlers in her arms how many remember that one and um, there was a woman in Andrea Yates some remember, remember that name down in Texas she drowned her five children in the bathtub. And you shake your head and you wonder how these things could be. How could a, a loving mother do something like that, commit such a terrible act uh, to her own children, her own flesh and blood? And I don't want to be a downer with a new baby in the room, with a new parents in the room. Hopefully that's not the case today. But the truth is, there's a devil in the world, and he's busy. He's busy. He wants to destroy the world and destroy any sense of, any semblance of normalcy and stability in the world and to get people depressed and discouraged. All right, he's busy all the time. And there's a, there's a word that no one wants to talk about, and that's the word sin. All For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, Romans 6, 23. And uh, it's because of sin, the, world, the word no one wants to talk about, no one wants to touch. Oh, I had a misdeed, an indiscretion, I made a mistake, I had a fault, I have some flaws, I have some foibles. Yo, you're a sinner. Amen. You're a sinner. Yeah. Carl Minninger, the great American psychiatrist, probably sort of the dean of American psychiatry. He wasn't a saved man. He wasn't a true believer. But um, decades ago, even unsaved doctors and psychiatrists, they would hit upon a great spiritual truth once in a while that it seems to elude a lot of preachers today. And uh, he talked in his, he wrote a book called Whatever Became of Sin. There's an unsaved psychologist writing a book called Whatever Became of Sin. That's the problem no one wants to, to, to discuss. That's the word no one wants to mention. And in the foreword of his book, he tells the story of a guy who stood on a Chicago street corner back in the mid-1960s. And as people were walking by on their way to work early in the morning, he would just point at them and say, guilty. And somebody else come on, guilty. And Dr. Minniger writes about two men walking by and one says to the other, how did he know, right? You know, you know my wife doesn't know about that problem, my, and so forth. And, and the point Dr. Minniger was making is that just below the surface, every man is a sinner, and he knows he's a sinner. 
He tries to assuage that guilt and pass over it with alcohol, with drugs, with fornication, with perversion, with diversions of sports and television and movies, you name it. He tries to cover over that guilt. He doesn't want to live with that guilt. So he tries to cover over it and pretend it doesn't exist, but it's there nonetheless. And it didn't take much uh, prompting to bring that realization, that, that reality to the surface for a lot of people passing by. And um, without God controlling men's lives, uh, men can be capable of anything. The very first man ever born into the world became the first murderer. His name was Cain. And so every man, uh, and I might add every woman, is capable of just about every kind of sin. Just give it an opportunity, give them enough time, uh, and who knows? You just have nothing but mayhem and chaos. But there's a real devil in the world, and he's busy. And he delights in ruining people's lives and frustrating the world the way he does. And um, the arms of, a, of a, a mother are supposed to be a safe place, right? Abraham Lincoln said, all that I am or ever hope to be, I owe to my angelic mother. His mother died when he was only eight years old. So the, the influence of a loving mother uh, cannot be overstated in the lives of children. But you and I live in a day and age right now where babies aren't even safe in their mother's womb. They're not safe in their mother's womb. A modern Democrat party is the face of evil, in my mind. You might not agree with me, but that's okay. Everyone's entitled to be wrong. But, uh, I mean, really, the party, of, the party of gay marriage, the party of homosexuality, the party of abortion, the, the party of slavery. You know, it was the Republican Party that freed the slaves back in the 1860s. Abraham Lincoln was the first Republican president. He signed the Emancipation Proclamation, gave... Uh, black Americans, they went from slave property to free men, just like that. The Democrats dug in and wanted to preserve slavery. Now they've twisted in history, they make you think Republicans invented slavery. And that's what's being basically taught and, and uh, inferred by public schools, public education, colleges, the news media. No, no, the face of evil. Uh, has a big D in front of its name right now, at least here in the United States. And um, But uh, keep your place in Genesis 22. And I want you to go forward to the book of Isaiah, chapter 49. Isaiah 49. And um, Isaiah 49, and start with verse 13. Now listen to what God says here. Starting at verse 13, Sing, O heavens, and be joyful, O earth, and break forth into singing. O mountains, for the Lord hath comforted his people, and will have mercy upon his afflicted. But Zion said, The Lord hath forsaken me, and my Lord hath forgotten me. Notice verse 15. Can a woman forget her sucking child, that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget the women, yet will I not forget thee. That's what God says. So verse 1, or rather point number 1, if you're taking notes today. The father loves his son. God's love is modeled, it's set forth as a pattern in a father's love for his son. Um... It's not the love that a woman has for her child. It's not the love that a husband has for a wife. But it's the love that a father has for his son. This gives, actually gives new, new meaning to other verses later in the scriptures. First uh, John 1 verse 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. For as many as are uh, led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God, Romans 8, 14 tells us. Hebrews 12, verses 6 and 7, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Uh, if ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? Now, uh, pay attention to this. 
that means that if a excuse me a Roman Catholic is trusting Holy Mary, the Mother of God, to save him, he's in trouble. If he's trusting a church, a Holy Mother Church, as it's often called, to save him, he's in trouble. Only the Savior can save. If a Mormon is trusting his temple marriage to his wife, uh, or she's trusting hers to her husband to somehow save them, they're in trouble. They're in trouble. That is not the standard. Those are not the, the epitome of God's love. God's love is modeled, is epi it's, the, it's epitomized by a father's love for his son in the, in the Bible. And uh, go back to Genesis 22 again. And let's read verses 3 through 14. I'm going to try to move along here for time's sake today. Genesis 22 verses 3. Through 14, and Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and clave the wood for a burnt offering, for the burnt offering, and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, laid it upon Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire in the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. And they came to the place which God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar there, and laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand, and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven, and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah-Jireh, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. Verse 3, it says he went unto the place of which God had told him. And then also in verse 9, it says they came to the place which God had told him of. And that leads me to point number 2, and that is, that is this. Um, not only does the father love his son, but there is a place you must go to to find it. It's found at a certain place. It's found at a certain place. In the Old Testament, if a man desired the, the blessing of God, he had to do what God had commanded to be done. Follow the commandments. Do what God told men to do. He couldn't just pick and choose which commandments he liked and which ones he didn't and sort of make up his own rules. He had to do what God said to do and do it God's way. Uh, in the book of Luke, chapter 1, you don't need to turn, but there in verses 5 and 6, we read about John the Baptist's parents. Zacharias and Elizabeth and it says in those two verses that they were both righteous How walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless They were still living in Old Testament times. This was before the birth of Jesus Still living in Old Testament times and their righteousness was based upon their degree of obedience to the commandments and the laws of God Deuteronomy 6 verse 25 Moses told the people, it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us. That's how a person's righteousness was measured and established um, in the Old Testament. But, you know, whenever it's a, a, a political year in America, we hear 
a lot of ministers and politicians often, they'll quote um, 2 Chronicles 7, verse 14. And it says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now, you want to notice, when you read through your Bible, you want to notice those places that start with if, and they conclude with then, because that shows you the conditions necessary for God to act. And they're very instructive. Uh, unfortunately, every unbelieving person today thinks that God operates the same way now that he did then. If I'm just good enough, if I give enough money, if I go to church, uh, or if I or contribute to the to the collection plate, if I do this, if I'm charitable over here, if I do that over there, that somehow I'll get God's attention and he'll welcome me into heaven. That is not it. That's not it at all. Like, um, and they sort of think that, well, let my conscience be my guide. Boy, that's a real feeble thing to trust. The Bible says about some people in the New Testament, their conscience is seared with a hot iron. They know what's right, they know what's wrong, and they go ahead and do it wrong anyway. Figure out, rationalize it, I'll justify it later on. I'll explain my way, I'll apologize. <laughs> they then get away with it, and some, some political uh, advisor said it's easier to apologize than to ask for permission first. That's why people get away with all kinds of rotten things, and they say, well, I'm sorry. Sorry doesn't cut it. Somehow saying I'm sorry will excuse all the things you did wrong and knowing you were doing wrong. That's not how the, how God sees life. That's not how things are supposed to work. But uh, like Frank Sinatra's famous song, right? The, what's the theme song in hell? I did it my way. But the Bible says in 1 John 4 verse 19, we love him. Why? Because he first loved us. And the Apostle Paul says in Romans 5, 8, that God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I'm so glad he came to this world, took a chance, died for the sake of sinners, was punished on behalf of every sinner, and then makes an offering to me that I, I couldn't refuse when I was six years old. I trusted Christ to save me. It was a very easy transaction. I went from sinner to saint that fast. And it's just as real and vivid in my mind right now as the day it happened. But uh, God demonstrated his love first by sending the Lord Jesus Christ to Calvary. He lived as a man. He walked as a man. He can identify with men. But unlike men, he had no sins that needed to be forgiven. He was the perfect and pure, sinless, virtuous son of God, dying as a substitute for the rest of us. And... Uh, and he died on the cross of Calvary, and it's at the cross of Calvary, or Mount Calvary, Golgotha, however you want to call it, and that's where God's love was deposited. That's where you have to go to find the love of God. Now, obviously, because of centuries of time and so forth, you can't go there um, and reenact the crucifixion, but you go there by faith. It's a spiritual transaction. I believe that one day Jesus Christ was dying for all the sins that I would one day commit. And on that basis, I can trust in his death to cover my sin, to cover my guilt. A great transaction takes place. All of his perfection and virtue and, and righteousness are credited to me. All of my sin is put upon him. And like I say, you go from a sinner to saint in a moment of time. Of course, you can only go there by faith, it's a, it's a spiritual transaction that has to take place. The modern idea is that, well, God loves all sinners, he just hates their sin. That's actually not true. That's not scriptural. Turn again in your Bibles, I apologize for making you turn more often than we normally do, but turn, if you will, to the book of Psalms. Psalm 5. Psalm 5. And... Uh, one verse there, Psalm 5, notice verse 5. The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hatest all workers 
of iniquity. God doesn't just hate their sin, he hates them if they haven't obeyed the commandments for righteousness. Look at Psalm 7 and verse 11. God judges the righteous and God is angry with the wicked every day. And one more, Psalm 11. Psalm 11, verse 5. The Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked and him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. That's God's soul. In the New Testament, this is reinforced in, in John 3, verse 36. He, Jesus said, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. God's judgment is hanging over your head, waiting to fall upon you when you die. So thirdly, let me say this, God hates sin and sinners. That might sound like, that might sound false. That might sound like something. I've never heard that before. God hates sin and he hates the sinner. Yeah, I just read it to you. Don't shoot the messenger because you don't like the message. The Bible says God is angry with the wicked every day. Now, how, how is it that God uh, could hate sinners and do something to show pure love for the sinner? Well, are you upset and angry with your kids when they disobey? If you're an honest parent, you'd say, yeah. Sometimes your, parent, your, your kids can embarrass you like nobody else can, right? It's like they've been practicing it. They, they want to embarrass their dad and mom. They want to do something that brings shame to the family name or shame to your mom and dad's reputation. But do you love them any less? Even when they're bad, even when they misbehave, even when they deserve punishment for what they've done, you don't love them any less. You can love and, and, and hate the things your kids do and, and be very displeased with the kid them, them himself at the same time loving them like you'd never loved anyone else before. It's an amazing thing, the, the, the way God constructed people, that two things can exist simultaneously and both be true. Well, how much more so with a God? He hates sin and he hates the sinner when the sinner is guilty of it. Uh, especially as long as that sinner has makes no shows no interest in being saved, trusting God, and, and having his record clear. Uh, and at the same time, he demonstrated pure love, perfect love, by sending Jesus Christ to die for that sinner. Now, it's, it's hanging over a lost man's head, waiting to fall when he dies and wake up without Jesus Christ. You know, God doesn't shower just some continuous blanket of love out there in the world and gosh wringing his hands wishing I could do more to save people I wish gosh I wish they knew how much I cared and you know that, that's not God at all that's how God's love is talked about many times in the Calvinist mentality Calvinism uh, teaches that God decided long ago in eternity who he would save and who he would not save these are what Calvinists call God's eternal decrees he decreed who he would save and he decreed who he would not save before he made before any man was even born before any man was even created in the world God had already decided who he would redeem and who he would not redeem and that way as time unfolded Jesus Christ died he only shed enough blood to cover the sins of those that God had chosen uh, and not those that God had rejected that's a lot of hooey yeah. the Bible's view is a little different the Bible's view is that uh, God placed his love where anybody could have access to it. And then he said, whosoever will may come. Amen. There was a, I heard a radio caller, one of these radio Bible call-in shows. And they were asking, uh, the caller was asking questions. Does God um, love Satan uh, in spite of his rebellion? Is, uh, the answer is no. <laughs> God's not on any obligation to love somebody if they've, uh, show no interest in getting right with God and doing what God says to become right and have Christ as their Savior. Here in Genesis 22, Isaac is a marvelous type, a foreshadow 
of the Lord Jesus Christ who would come uh, many years later. In verse 7, Isaac asked, where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them, together. God will provide himself. That's a beautiful picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. God manifest in the flesh, as 1 Timothy 3.16 tells us. So point number four is this. God has intervened. God has intervened on man's behalf. Verse 9 reads, They came to the place which God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar there, and laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. You know, Isaac was evidently big enough and strong enough to carry a shoulder full of wood up, up the hillside, which means that Abraham couldn't have wrestled his son and, you know, horn swoggled him or hogtied him and uh, put him on an altar unless Isaac was willing, unless Isaac was compliant and yielded to his father. Abraham couldn't have done it. And, um, which is a marvelous picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ willingly offered himself as a sacrifice for my sins and for your sins on your behalf. He says in John 10, verses 17 and 18, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. You know, uh, he said earlier in the chapter, that get thee into the land of Moriah and offer him there on one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Jerusalem, it used to be called Jebus, uh, or the land of the Jebusites. Excuse me. Um, according to First Chronicles chapters 21-22, David built an altar unto the Lord at the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. And that was the land which would later be, would be renamed as Jerusalem, the city of peace. And uh, in that part of the Bible, it said, David said, this is the house of the Lord God. And the Bible seems to indicate that Abraham sacrificed Isaac. And there's, a, there's enough, there are enough verses you could construe and come to this conclusion that Abraham offered Isaac on the same spot where centuries later the Lord Jesus Christ's cross would stand. Mount Calvary and um, Jesus offered himself willingly as a substitute for the sinner as a sacrifice for sin and uh, Hebrews 11 verse 17 Isaac is even called Abraham's only begotten son totally rejecting Ishmael the father of the so-called father of the Arabs and the Muslims now you see why God illustrated his love by a father for his son because it would one day be fulfilled in God the Heavenly Father's love for the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, your dads, don't just sort of want to relive your youth by watching your son play Little League Baseball or soccer or whatever the sport may be. I, I, dads sort of do that. I don't know why it is we, our glory days, you know, or glory days that we never had that we we're hoping our son will have as a proxy or a substitute for us. And um, you ever wondered why God spends so much time with genealogies? Matthew 1, Luke chapter 3, the books of First and Second Chronicles, and all of those lists of names, and so-and-so who begat so-and-so, 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 who begat so-and-so. A lot of begatting going on there. And, and the simple reason is, even if those names, even if those places, even if those things are even slightly connected to the Lord Jesus Christ, God thinks it's important enough to put in his book. Amen. They say out in the world, any friend of so-and-so is a friend of mine. Well, any, friends, any friend of the Lord Jesus Christ is a friend of God's. And God's interested in his son, and he's interested in anybody who's interested in his son. 1 John 5, verses 11 and 12 tell, tell us, This is the record that God hath given unto us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. It's a very simple matter, a very simple proposition. 
The day I trusted Jesus Christ to save me, November 5th, 1967, I was six years old, and I can tell you exactly where it happened. I can show you where it happened. It happened right here, right there in front of the pulpit. My dad was preaching. I was sitting in the front row. I heard the invitation at the end of his sermon, and I, something about that resonated in my heart. For the very first time, I knew I was guilty. I knew I was a sinner, and if there was a hell, I didn't want to go to hell. I was talking to some uh, friends, uh, folks this morning earlier. If, if all you know is you don't want to go to hell, that's plenty of good motive for trusting Jesus Christ. You don't need religion. You don't need church membership. You don't need water baptism. You don't need the seven sacraments of the Catholic Church. You don't need 32 degrees of the Masonic Order. You don't need any of that stuff. You need Jesus Christ. Only he can save. Only the Savior can save. Are you willing to admit to God <coughs> that you're a sinner? As, a, as you've never been born again, and as in your heart you would say, you know, Pastor, I don't, I'm not sure that if I died right now, I'd wake up in heaven with Jesus Christ. You can know. It would be a very simple transaction God can do for you in just a few brief moments, and it'll change your life for all of eternity.